Okay, we are officially ready to roll and I will keep admitting um, everyone in as uh, more guests filter into um, our town hall here. Um, or at least the way that I've been kind of putting this, this is a conversation on community policing or a conversation with law enforcement here in Harper Woods. Um, so I'm Councilwoman Ernestine Lyons and um, a while ago I reached out to our chief uh, Vincent Smith and um, our director of public safety to ask if there were ways that we could have more interactive conversations around um, not only community policing, but just law enforcement in our community. Um, and really, this was a way to ask, in an ideal world, what would we want from our public safety officers? And um, so as a result, I, I invited um, Mr. Tolfrey, um, and I'm saying that right, it's Tolfrey, right? Yeah, okay. Like 1-800, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's what, the whole time I was thinking toll free. Um, but, um, you know, so I invited him to also speak to, you know, just community policing because of his background as a 28 year Harper Woods Police Department veteran. Um, and I also invited Darlene Blair. Um, I hope she can still make it, but she did let me know that there may be uh, the possibility of her not being able to be a part of this conversation. She is a former Detroit police officer and um, was also a community policing um, a uh, person who really advocated for that and also worked in those um, areas. And so without further ado, I am going to introduce our panel here and read a little bit about them. Um, so Director Vincent Smith um, is our current public safety director here in the city of Harper Woods. He's been a Harper Woods police officer since 1997 um, after serving in the army from 1987 to 1991 um, as a military police officer. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree from Michigan, uh, Eastern Michigan University in public safety um, and was promoted to patrol sergeant in 2002, cross-trained as a firefighter in 2013, and was promoted to lieutenant uh, in 2015. Um, he has worked as a firearms instructor, active shooter instructor, which I took active shooter lessons um, from him. And um, I came, went in there being a little bit of a wimp and came out being, you know, just a, you know, really, really confident, um, you know, <laughs> future, I guess I understand, I understand exactly what it is that, you know, police officers are, you know, up against in some ways. Um, and then last year, uh, Vince Smith became our director of public safety. So um, I'm going to jump right into uh, Ron Tolfrey is a lifetime Harper Woods resident um, and retired from the Harper Woods Police Department, um, a Harper Woods High School graduate, and has served as a police cadet patrol officer, um, tra traffic officer, youth officer, sergeant, and uh, since retirement has worked for a surveillance company. Um, and so thank you very much, gentlemen, um, for, for coming into this conversation. And I do wanna let everyone know that this is gonna be very informal. So any questions that you may have, um, of course, we're gonna filter them and say like, okay, well, maybe we, we won't take that question or we will, but um, we want this to be something that is a um, sort of lead up to more of the challenges of community policing and hearing about your perspectives and then talking to our law enforcement candidately. And then also this can be something that, you know, we really have been having these conversations around setting up a future public safety commission. Um, and we wanna have a better idea of what the community really wants from um, such a public safety commission, um, you know, and so, you know, we, we get a lot of questions from residents on council talking about, you know, do we need to have a beat or more patrol officers or what's going on with Kelly Road or, you know, um, do we need more coordination from Detroit police? So I really want to welcome your questions and, um, you know, hopefully we can not only get answers from either, you know, Ron or from um, our director of public safety that have with specific questions that have to do with Harper Woods. And so, um, Without further ado, gentlemen, um, please let us know if there's anything about yourselves that I left out. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, tell us a little bit more about yourselves if I left anything uh, out. I just want to add that uh, Ron was my first, one of my first sergeants, so. And look how well he turned out. Right, right. Nice, nice, awesome, awesome. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is just kind of start us off with a couple of questions um, and, you know, just, just address 
some of the things that you know we want to see maybe more of and then I know burning questions I've had have to do with uh, what are some of the procedural and operational challenges and, and kind of changes that police departments have to make when it comes to, you know, having more community policing? And I'll, I'll, I'll pose that question to you first, um, Chief Smith. Okay. Uh, you know, first of all, you have to have a buy-in by the department. Your members get them to buy into this. Um, it is an organizational transformation. You have to come up with a written plan. Uh, policy and procedure, define what everyone's roles are, and, and uh, establish you know who you want to buy in as far as the community goes. So yeah, there is a, there is an organizational change there that has to be done. Um, I believe when I first started, we had a, a policy about community policing. I don't know, it went away over the years. Ron, do you recall that? It was a specific policy addressing it. I don't. Know. I know we've had several different things that try to do involving that, like the bike patrol and they have to try to get people more out into the community. Um, I don't recall any specific policy on it. I mean, they just did the, the uh, foot patrols and the bike patrol to try to get more people out in the community, but past that, I don't remember anything. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Because, uh, you know, you kind of want to know, I know I had a kind of somewhat angry letter from from a resident saying, you know, well, what can we do about, you know, just kind of having the police more present in, you know, our neighborhoods, just walking the beat and, you know, just just being more present. And you almost wonder, you know, th there are only so many finite resources that can really put police in so many different places. And, you know, you can't be everywhere. So, you know, what what are some ways that you know you could have more of you know just just what exactly are the parameters of patrol officers and you know what are some things that are that were done in the past and what are some maybe future plans for you know just being a little bit more present in the community well uh, you know when i started we had we started at uh, the max of seven officers per shift um as time has gone on we, we dropped down to five now we're at four per shift Due to other things, um, so I think we have to find some creative ways to get a, some more bodies in the department. I believe that's why we started hiring part-time officers in 2012, 2013 to try and help out with that. Unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of turnover with that, and we had, we haven't been able to retain officers part-time. So, and you add in the whole public safety part of it, where your cross-trained officers are pulled to go fight fires. Um, kind of takes away from the neighbors a little bit. But like I said earlier, I think you have to have a buy-in from the whole department and uh, dedicate, have a dedication towards involving more in the community. I know we have gotten away from that. You know, I will admit that over the years. There's been, as we've gotten a little busier than we used to be with less people, it's basically going run to run. I think the things have changed. I mean, when I worked, we had a four man minimum per shift. And you see a lot on Facebook, people saying, I never see a police car, you know, my street, or whatever. But even back then with four cars in a patrol and everybody has an assigned area, you know, you may just turn your back and a car goes by your street. You're not gonna, it's difficult to actually see them unless there's a traffic stop or something that draws your attention to them. And so, I mean, they're out there. I don't know what the minimum is now, but they're out there. I don't think you're seeing them sitting around doing nothing. They're always on patrol. Once you get an accident in the freeway, well, there goes your entire department is down there tied up for an hour, two hours, whatever it is. You know, so it, it, you're not going to see them constantly on patrol in the city. It's just, that's not going to happen with the manpower available. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, we actually are getting a question um, from from Lauren. Honestly, if you want, you can chime in and um, ask your question, um, you know, because it's, it's going to be very informal. Um, I just wanted to kind of start us all off and, you know, ask a few of those questions that to me were burning questions and, um, you know, just uh, going from there. But feel free to just chime right in. And the question comes from Lauren. Good evening, gentlemen. Thanks for doing oh, this. No problem. Hello. Um, so I, I just I know that especially for Harper Woods last year has been very um, it's been it's been challenging both in terms of sort of uh, social matters, but also in terms of COVID. 
are there changes that have been made that maybe your average citizen, you know, hasn't necessarily had an exposure to or an awareness of that you can speak to? As far as the organization of the department? C correct, yes. No, I mean, we, we did, when COVID started, like a lot of other departments, we did stop responding to um, minor incidents. You know, if it was anything involving an assault or a felony, we were responding, but we were encouraging a lot of the residents to stay, um, to do the reports online. Just because we are such a small department and we start losing officers or firefighters, it's gonna cripple us. You know, we won't have anybody to respond. So we did make those uh, changes, but other than that, there hasn't really been much. Thank you, thank you for that question, Lauren. Um, and you know, so you, you, Chief, you described, um, you know, kind of having this buy-in from the community. And um, so, what are some of the measures that really promote a collaborative relationship between police departments and the communities that we serve? Um, and what are ways to really having forums like this or, you know, just, just what more of, you know, how much more interactive do we need to be? Yeah, I mean, I've been hearing this since I got promoted last year and obviously COVID had, had a big uh, uh, negative effect on any kind of interaction with the community right now. Um, right. Any large groups or whatever. So I'd rather have the large group meetings and, you know, I'd rather hear from the citizens. You know, I've heard um, certain complaints about the public safety department over the last months, but you know, it's, I, I kind of describe it as like being in a relationship where you think everything's great and all of a sudden you, you get bombarded with all this stuff. It's like, you know, I, I'm not that far removed from being on road patrol. So I was out there on patrol and hearing, you know, but I didn't hear any of these complaints I'm starting to hear now. So I, you know, I encourage everyone to email me, call me, uh, like a few of the residents have, and, you know, we'll address your concerns. You know, I heard something yesterday that, um, one of the older residents in the community feels like we're not providing the same services we have since I've been here, which we have. Uh, we might not get to it as quick as we used to, but we're still picking up stray dogs when we can. Um, you know, barking dog complaints, garbage complaints, you know, leaves being brought out early. We're still looking into that stuff, but we do as a community have to realize there are more serious incidents happening in the city that we have to address first. Thank you, thank you for that. And we do have a question. Cynthia, you can feel free to ask your question okay. and David. Um, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, let me, let me give you my email. It's, it's V like Vince Smith, S M I T H, at harperwoods.net. And it's, if you go to the city website, it's on there too under the public safety department. Director Smith? Yes. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of concern lately, um, especially with the southwest side with having, uh, well, the shootings began with Eastland and been continuous since there. And I got to be honest, we do not see the patrol cars as often. And I, I do know that, uh, that they're very busy. Um, but the, the southwest side is, is we're really hurting over here. Um, and people, people are scared and selling their homes over here, um, feeling that we're not protected. Okay. Uh, we can divide the patrol, but obviously like we get pulled away. It's just like the traffic complaints. As far as the shootings go, you know, I can't get into it too much, but these are not random acts. All, all the shootings that have happened in the city this year are not random. So one way or another, there's some kind of connection between these houses or at the mall, whatever. Okay, so it's not like somebody's just driving randomly down the street and shooting. It's, there's some kind of some kind of dispute with, with the parties. So and we're, not, we're not, and we're not alone. Harper Woods is not alone. All right, Roseville. I just was got my hair cut today in my barber shop in Roseville. Where I grew up, and they were talking about the three shootings they had this week over there. So yeah. I think you you add this year is an anomaly. You have you have the COVID. Um, you had the social unrest, the, the economic um, fallout from COVID and people losing their jobs. There's a lot of angry people out there. Um, and unfortunately, I think disputes are not being uh, solved civilly. People are resulting to handguns. But I, you know, like I said, we know that that South End, what's going on, the cars will get there. But obviously, if there's something going on the other end, we can't stay there all day. Is anything being done to address that problem? Do, 
do we have? Because I know we ran out of grants. So what can we do to help rectify that? Well, we, we got a net out there for more part-time officers to try to recruit more. Um, and we, we have to write more grants this year, the first of the year. Start getting more money. And, you know, the city's looking at some other financial ways to, to, to get some bodies in here. Yeah, because with the uh, shootings, Director Smith, all I wanted to follow up with was uh, we used to get an Excels almost on every major crime we had, either with a description or something. And with this year being as crazy as it has been for the city in hey, many Charles ways, um, the Excels seem like more um, public service that notices. For anyone who's not speaking, if you could mute yourself. Thanks. Okay, David, I'm sorry you were saying something, but oh. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mute anyone who isn't speaking. That's okay. Um, no, we were getting concerned because we used to get in Excels that gave us a, you know, a description or at least a heads up around the community. Mm -hmm. um, and this past year, we just haven't been getting them. And that's the concern is, is there's no, not only are we scared, but there's no communication to the community as there used to be. Okay, I think I kind of been on there a lot more than what I've seen in the past. But um, if there if there isn't any information about the shooters, we have no information who the shooter is. I, I think we put out a message back in August that we needed more the community's help. Um, that detectives would go investigate our lives, and no one was cooperating with us. So there, there's more involved into that part where we have to establish a trust again to, to get people to cooperate. Um, but we're also in in, in a, a time when a lot of people don't want to to get involved if they do see something because they're afraid of uh, retribution or retaliation. And I think, I think that, you know, um, oh, go ahead, sir. I was gonna say, I think on Dave's point, I think the, cause I'm on the Facebook thing a lot and people just wanna hear that, okay, this happened. We don't have information about it, but just letting you know that it happened and to watch for whatever. I think that's the thing that something happens and it just, once it gets on the Facebook pages, it gets blown into whatever. And just so, you know, you never see anything coming out from the city. So I think just something that would say, we had this overnight, this incident, and we have no information. I mean, just that type of thing. Yeah, I think I is what people think are looking for. We're going to look at getting a Facebook page for the department because I'm not going to get into the social media part, but I also think social media gets blown out of proportion. Um, yeah. So it does. That, that's why I don't go on there. Uh, I, I, you know, you want to come, you want the truth. Email me, I'll give you the answer if I can. But uh, I agree with, with part of that, okay? I think we've been doing pretty good as far as putting information out though for everything that's going on in the city. If we don't have, even if we tell you there, there's a shooting here, we don't have any information. You obviously know there's a shooting. Um, there's, you got, everyone's pretty good about passing on information in the neighborhoods. Right, and I think this this is sort of you know a way for people to to even let let us know like what way that maybe city council could pick up the slack or you know if there's a way that we can sort of all be on the same page for what the community wants to see and you know some of these grievances and you know ways for all of us to to be on that same page in addition like you know if having an official city Facebook page is something that, you know, more of the community wants to see so that, you know, there is a faster way to communicate. Um, and, you know, just things, things have been changing, you know, with this, this rise and, you know, just folks out there more active with the, the shooting incidences and things of that sort. I think it's really important for us to maybe, you know, have more channels of you know communication but this is the beginning of you know just kind of having those kind of conversations um that can lead to just just more you know citizen information which leads to the 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 whole purpose of really this kind of discussion um is like a public safety commission so um chief smith do you mind um kind of explaining what a public safety commission would look like and you know what that kind of definition would be and you know who does it consist of or you know sure. oh, we're still working out the details though yeah, and initially i i, I uh, pushed this out the council i believe it was july to try and get the the ball rolling mm -hmm. you had not really an oversight commission but a, a civilian liaison commission uh with, with the citizens 
and you know it'd be involved with uh, like citizen complaints was brought up to me that some citizen complaints some citizens are afraid to come to the police department they don't think it'll be followed through well we have members on this commission where they can act like the liaison and they can pass the the complaint on to me if, if something comes in um, be involved with our training as far as knowing what training is going on and, and what our policies and procedures are to, to relate to the rest of the community. And that would be comprised, you know, a city our size, maybe five, five residents. Um, we have to decide, you know, it'd be to cover different age groups, um, you know, a minister maybe, you know, it, it, it's up to the council to decide what they would really, you know, and, and the community, what they would really want. But then it would have to be an ordinance passed for this and then uh, some kind of election process. You'd serve maybe two to three years, something like that. Um, but basically that's what would be a liaison for the community to the police department. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and, you know, I think that that's something that I'm fully in support of. I really think that, you know, just, with some of the complaints, I think it could be just a good way for us to not only have that neighborhood watch sort of mentality, but then to also be able to, you know, really have more communication, um, like a line of communication that's more direct and more open. So um, with that, I'm just going to, you know, turn it over to, you know, everyone here in the audience. If you do have questions, feel free to chime in and, you know, ask them. And, you know, if not, I'm going to start us off with uh, one other question that I did have, you know, um, you, what are what are some ways that maybe we can um, work more with, say, the school districts or, you know, I understand that there is a, a police officer who is assigned to the school district. And, you know, I remember seeing that growing up when I went to Harper Woods High, um, class of 04. And, you know, we had, you know, um, a, a police officer there. So, um, what are some, some ways that we can kind of have a little bit more relationship with, um, the school district does have a very big influence in community events and community organizing, um, here. So, um, what are ways we can make that, that relationship better? Yeah, uh, again, I think COVID kind of killed, I mean, starting to establish my, my requiring some of the staff there, um, but COVID kind of killed any kind of consistent working relationship other than everyone, uh, working remotely or whatever. So it's kind of, it's just not there, but uh, we, we are communicating the, the uh, school resource officer to sign a patrol right now because of our lack of body. So um, he's still acting as a liaison between us and the school district. Um, so I, in between the city, we all have a vested interest as far as the city uh, government and the police department to, to keep that relationship going. So I, as far as that goes, I, don't, I think we're okay. Um, Miss Martin, Miss Martin, that got elected to the school board. Is that who, that who, uh, was Stacy White. Miss White, Miss White. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's Corinne there. Sorry. Um, so I, I know uh, Alicia McKay. Is she still? Um, yes, yeah, she's the school board president. Yep. Yeah, so I, I you know, I made connections with her, um, and we, you know, like to work with the CCI Center and all that. And um, one, one other question before I kind of like turn it over to, you know, folks who have more questions here. Um, you know, what do you think are significant differences in the way that, you know, police act with minorities versus non-minorities? Do you think that there are issues there that you, you need to be, you know, addressed and how we can make things better? Or um, what are some, some things that are kind of already being done to, to really kind of mitigate um, just those conversations on bias and, you know, are there trainings that, you know, other than our city just went through the entire city, every single city employee, including myself, we went through cultural sensitivity training and implicit bias training, which was, I think, very helpful. Um, but, but yeah, that's a question a little bit more about, you know, interaction. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously the police department's been participating in that type of training for a few years now, as far as de-escalation training and, uh, mental health awareness and, and persons in crisis training, recognizing that. Um, but obviously you have to recognize because even though we have different cultures and we're a blended community, there's also subcultures to those cultures. So you have to be aware and, uh, you know, any of that part of that training we have, we're, we're getting that to understand because you, you know, you learn why kids walk in the street, right? If they, if they come from Detroit, you know, or they walk in groups, you have to understand why. It's not because they're defying the city ordinance or whatever, it's just 
Detroit, either they're running from stray dogs or running from people trying to jump them. So you have to get that understanding. Um, you know, that was years ago we started to learn that. And as we progress, you know, um, we have an implicit bias policy that um, bias implicit policing that we're, that's in the works there that all the officers signed for and uh, acknowledging the policy. So that's one thing we didn't have um, prior to June. So you know, recognizing that the deficits that we are deficiencies that we have to address certain concerns. Thank you, thank you. And um, so, Mr. Mr. Tolfrey, I just kind of wanted to have your way in on you know um, how how has how have some of those those issues as far as like the the demographics how have they changed as far as do you think. Um, Harper Woods police were were different then, maybe more strict when you know you were a Harper Woods police officer. Um, uh, and do you think that things were worse? And you know now things have kind of gotten into you know just just better relations. And what are you? What is your perspective on you know just kind of having more you know just cohesion with with policing in the community? Sure. Sure, I was hired in 74 as a cadet and went on the road in 77. So, I mean, it was 180 degrees different how things were done back then. I mean, the, the population was completely different. Um, and from where the department has, has come now, it's come a, come a tremendous distance in improving relations. Uh, I remember when I was working, we had our first black officer um, whose name escapes me for a moment, but he became the uh, school liaison officer. Charles, Charles Walker. Charles yeah, Walker. Walker. I remember him when I was yeah. in high school there. And so, it, you know, and change have been made, but there was, back then, I mean, was, the culture was different. I mean, so, you know, because I've been retired for about 15 years now. So it's it's a whole different culture now, and you can see it in the makeup of the department now, and the people, that, when I see patrol officers on the street, and that, that's different. Um, I think just in the overall, since and I think Harper Woods has done a great job. The citizens here have done a great job in coming together for the most part as a community. I mean, you see that on like the Facebook pages that we're on with the community residents and that where so many people work together for things where I think that back in the, you know, 70s and that, that you know, there was a community togetherness, but there was no racial component to it at all, zero. Um, so I think the city and the department have come a long way since then, sure, I'm sure there's there's areas to improve, as there always is, and there are always going to be those instances where things stick out or whatever. But I think for the most part, I mean, it's been a tremendous uh, improvement. Thank you, thank you for that, gentlemen. And so, um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and open it up to you know everyone here. Um, and if we do have any questions um, or, you know, if you want to go around and kind of, you know, ask any particular questions about, um, you know, just our policing. And then I know this, this also goes to, to me, like what kind of policies would you like to see, you know, um, you know, be able to, to have more of this environment. And as we, you know, work towards helping to establish, you know, just, just more of that atmosphere of community policing. You know, and I guess we'll probably get to see more of this in a post-COVID world. I think we're living in in definitely unparalleled times. So, um, but but yes, I'm gonna go ahead and open that up, open the floor, and we'll take some questions. Ernestine, if I could go first, just because I have to leave to go to another meeting. Sure. But I'm Mary Jo Harris, and I co-manage a coalition called A Healthy Girls Point in Harper Woods, and we've done uh, quite a bit of work in Harper Woods. Um, unfortunately, we can't be in the school this year, obviously, but the past two years, we've done some work on drug prevention there during Red Ribbon Week. We've done mental health days. Um, the uh, youth um, officer comes to our summer camps that we do for the middle school students. And he was also there for Red Ribbon Week um, talking to the kids about um, drug prevention. So I know that the police officers work very well with the staff in the, in the high school. In fact, we have a meeting with the high school principal tomorrow just to talk about what we can do virtually since we can't get into the schools doing drug prevention. So um, as, as, as far as I've seen being there, it's, it's a really good relationship. And, um, and the patrol officer, I'm drawing a blank to his name, works really well with the students and, and they really respect him. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to say is that we have done Narcan training for the community 
Um, every single uh, teacher and administrator in the high school in Harbor Woods was trained on Narcan. Um, we're going to do another one in the next couple of weeks at night, and I'll make sure I get you that, Ernestine, to send out to everyone. And we'll also be doing a QPR suicide prevention training, too, for the Harper Woods and Gross Point community. Mary Jo, would you be interested? Uh, we've had a public safety workshop uh, last month for different topics in the community, something separate than this. Would the Narcan training, would you be able to do a, a little bit on that? For Absolutely, yep. You just let me know a day and time, and we uh, use Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network, and we can do it virtually, um, or we'll see if somebody can come there, but just let me know. And then whenever you need the Narcan kits, let me know. We can drop them off. Okay. I would also be uh, interested more on the uh, Narcan because I, I have to use it for a certain pain medication I'm on, and they gave me two of, of, of these. What it, you know? I don't know if you can see it, um, but I have no idea how to use it. You know, I, I don't know, because I never had to worry about any reactions from the medication, but now I have to have it. So I'd at least like to know how to use it. You know what I'll do, Dave? I will put, I just put my email address in, um, in the chat. Email me tomorrow, and at least tomorrow we can go over in a little bit before we uh, get the training done, um, you know, the formal training done, but at least we can talk about it. I have a, um, a sheet that I can send you to that explains in more detail how to use it. Okay, but anything else, any programs, drug prevention, mental health that, um, that the coalition can help with, please email me and let me know. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, actually, Councilwoman Constantino actually uh, runs the crime reduction and law enforcement vertical of our uh, neighborhood economic development coalition. And so they actually have a lot more, like more informative, um, workshops of this nature uh, that are concerned with public safety and you know there I love that the fact that the chief seems to know everything about everything that has to do with public safety um, and you know he's always there to field questions and um, so I think you know having that safety how to do CPR how to you know keep keep your home safe and things of that sort I think are really beneficial um, you know and great great aspects of those kind of workshops so Thank you so much for coming. And I remember seeing you at the um, the coronavirus town hall that I had back in June. It was it was April. So um, thank you so much for coming. And I know that Susie Burshank normally am I saying her last name wrong? Yeah. Susie Birchback. Okay, Birchback. Um, she normally um, comes in person when we had the in person meetings at City Council and at the NADC. So we really appreciate the efforts of uh, Healthy Gross Point and Harper Woods. Um, you know, to in the community here. Sure. Well, thank you for everything you do and have a good Thanksgiving, everyone. And I will see you soon in one of the webinars that we have. So. Okay. That's thank great. you. Good night. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, any other questions from our audience here? Uh, okay. We have uh, Mr. Jarvis. Hi. Hey, thanks for hosting this, Ernestine. Mm -hmm. Uh, very interesting. Anyway, I do have a question for um, uh, for the chief of police, uh, Smith. There, um, I'm kind of curious. Do you <clears throat> how do you feel uh, about some of the laws in our state, uh, and maybe with the police unions? Do you think that uh, some of the laws maybe need to be changed or altered a bit so that? police officers can actually do their jobs the way they're supposed to do, if that makes any sense? I, I think it's doing a major haul, overhaul of everything, okay, to where everything's equal and fair. Um, I, I have different views on it, okay? Uh, I, I think everything's, the officers are allowed to do their jobs right now. Um, some, some bad apples have caused uh, police departments to come under attack. Um, but give me a specific, you know, law, and I'll see, you know, what, what you're talking about exactly. If you're talking about union stuff, uh, you know, that's got to be handled through the unions. Yeah, I mean, I was just saying in general, I know that, uh, you know, there's a lot. And by the way, let me, may I mention that uh, you guys are doing a fantastic job. Thank you. And uh, so, you know, I'm in a group called Harper Woods, We the People. And, of course, we support our police. But I was just kind of curious if if maybe because of the unions and maybe because of the laws in the state of Michigan, 
maybe prevent police officers sometimes, especially in, you know, situations where they can't really do their job. That's all. I can't really get anything specific for you uh, right now. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I know as far as our department goes, I don't, I don't see that part where we're not able to still do police work. I think that okay. the way the atmosphere is now in the, around the country, I mean, I think you may see more officers worried about doing their job for what's going to happen. If something goes wrong, what's going to happen to me and my family and everything else? I think you may see that more than them thinking the laws are preventing them from doing their job. I don't think that that is really outstanding. I think it's more of, gee, if I go in here and something happens and I shoot somebody, even though if they have a gun, you know, how am I going to be looked look at type of thing? So I think that may affect officers more than a law preventing them. Okay. Thank you for that. And um, Lauren, I know you had a question. Um... Well, it was more of a, just kind of for my own edification, um, <coughs> We, we, um, we've been talking a little bit about like managing like drugs and, and things related to that. And I, um, I just didn't know, is that a makeup of a lot of the, the crime or, I mean, can you even determine that or, or what is sort of the makeup of like, like what's going on in Harper Woods, I guess. As far as crime increases. So sure. I think what the question, I, maybe I can clarify a little bit more. What is the breakdown of like the types of crimes? Are we experiencing more shootings, more, you know, maybe robberies or robberies uh, from my understanding maybe have gone down because Eastland doesn't, isn't as robust as it once was as far as shopping and people who are, you know, just there and carjackings <laughs> and things of that nature. Um, are we seeing decreases in, you know, just the types of crimes versus a rise in crimes with, you know, maybe opioid abuse or something of that sort? No, if we kind of see a decrease in that. I mean, uh, three, four years ago, we had a, a huge increase of, with uh, drug use in the city coming across the border and us having to use Narcan. That's why we started having to get trained in that to, to save people's lives. Um, you know, this year is kind of an anomaly. I, I, I talked to uh, one of the news networks about the mall shootings because they were trying to do a story on across the state of mall shootings. I think Somerset had one last month as well. You know, I think this is just an anomaly this year. Um, compared to last year, we, we didn't have any uh, shootings at the mall at all. And yes, we, we've had an increase in the city this year. I think that's it, an increase in, in, in uh, gun shootings and then uh, traffic complaints. I think that's what we have the increase in is, you know, Traffic's been horrendous trying to address that problem. And so that is, that actually leads to one of my questions, like um, speeding is the number one thing. Um, I live on Old Homestead and there's a lot of like just up and down like drag racing. And so is that something that has increased over the years um, along with like a decrease in, you know, just mall related crimes? Um, and, you know, what are other than traffic calming devices, what are some, you know, practices in place to mitigate, you know, just kind of having that speeding at top, you know, top speeds up and down some of the longer, you know, right. the city. I mean, as Ms. Lyons know, we're, we're, you know, looking at getting uh, speed humps or speed bumps throughout the city. You know, I don't know how much that's going to cost. And you have the issue with the snow plows, you know, we have to remove them every year and you know, we have a limited DPW. You know, it's not excuses, but it's reality. We have a limited DPW in the fall. Residents look forward to having their leaves done. So it's either we, we assign the DPW workers to the leaves or, or, or removing all the uh, speed bumps every year. Um, so, yeah, it's something we have to address. And once again, it's not a, uh, a problem that's unique to Hartford Woods. Um, see it all the time. You know, on the way home, there's, it's scary driving on the freeway, and let alone the side street right now. Um, so I don't have a straight up answer for that. Due to the manpower issues, us assigning it, you know what happens is we'll assign somebody to that area for two weeks, nothing, right? The minute we leave, they'll start speeding through that area again. As people see, it's like, oh, there's a police officer. Let me let me slow down. Because I've noticed Beaconsfield a couple of years back, it used to be like people just drag race top speeds up and down Beaconsfield. And then when you saw the traffic, like the speedometers, I noticed there was like a decline. And and correct me if I'm wrong, have the statistics actually aligned with, yeah. you know. Yeah, I will say that since we put those, uh, well, the Beaconsfield ones I haven't been able to check out yet. We have to work out some software issue there. But the portable ones that we have, you know, last year we put them on Anita, Woodland, and uh, Eastwood earlier this year. 
And you'd be surprised, you know, some of the, the cars that were above 40, I, I think might've been police cars just trying to see if the thing was working right. Um, but they're usually between the 25 to 35, which, you know, 10 over still fast enough in the neighborhood, but it's not 50, 55. Um, so I think it is working a little bit. We, we need to increase by a few more of those. I know I moved them to Little Stone. Um, I think another part of Woodland. So I've moved them around since the summer now. And, and I actually do have a, another question about like, um, and then Lauren, I did see your hand go up. Um, right. The, um, have there been any fatalities due to, you know, the, the speeding? I, I remember I was driving home um, from Kroger and I saw right there on Vernier, um, there was a car speeding and it was going so fast that the, the light turned and it, it couldn't stop and it, it literally knocked over another car and Harper was police were right, right there. And this happened back in the summer, but I'm wondering if there are any fatalities because of, you know, just people's recklessness and this need for speed. Well, as Ron can uh, test to, I'm gonna knock on wood right now because the minute I say that we haven't anything, it's gonna happen. Um, I think the last one we had was last October where the, the gentleman uh, crashed in the, near Kroger over there up the embankment, the car caught on fire. I think that's the last one I can remember we had from a car if tell. For a while, they were having a lot on the freeway. That eight-mile turn, you know, it, it's killed a lot of people over the years. Um, and side street-wise, I think Eastwood was the last one we had when uh, it was three or four high school kids were killed. Yeah, I think the side streets are generally somebody goofing off kind of thing and too high and they hit a tree. But the freeway, yeah, the, the overpass is probably the um, eight-mile curve is probably the worst area. And a lot of times they're just in the border or just outside of our border in that corner. It, just, you know, too, we, Detroit doesn't patrol the freeway. They leave, it's MSP. So a lot of times we feel obligated to go south of Maras, Cadre area to assist until state police can get there. So it might, you know, if people ever wonder why we're in different areas, that's why it's, you know, we've saved a few lives that way. Well, yeah, the, the freeway, a lot of people don't realize too, it's 55 starting at like 11 mile all the way through Detroit. So they all think it's 70, you know, 70 plus. I actually, you know, didn't realize that there was like a, a change when you get back like further than 11 mile. Um, and I, that's, a, that's probably why so many people are honking at me, like drive fast. <laughs> um, but Lauren, I think you had a question and then um, thank you Alicia for joining. I saw you there. We were speaking of you earlier um, and any questions from anyone else as well? Okay. Yeah. I was just going to make the comment. So that uh, speed, the 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 I forget how you referred to it, but that device that you put on Little Stone, that's, that's my corner. Okay. Yes, that's my corner. And people cook through there all the time, and it makes me crazy because I also watch them not stop at that stop sign all day long. Yeah, I, used so live, I, I used to live by that stop sign too. So <laughs> cringy. Yeah. So I just I wanted to say that I know that makes a tangible difference. Like I I. I watched it happen. I've watched people now slow their roll as they're going through there. So I, those are working. And if that's a concern in our community, if we can get more of those, more power to you. Yeah, we were working on uh, with some of the Verizon or one of the cell phone companies was putting up more towers in the city. That was part of the agreement where if they put some towers up, they were going to provide signs. Again, COVID kind of slowed that down. So I don't know where we're at with that, but uh, yeah, hopefully in the future, if not, we're going to purchase more signs. That then that's another thing I would love to be able to just kind of, you know, if we could even put it on the city's website, like the stats on, you know, how much of a difference the traffic calming devices actually make on streets versus, you know, past, you know, indications of like, did people get more tickets on, you know, pre, you know, having the traffic calming devices versus post having them. So, you know, that that definitely be, you know, an interesting way to know how much of a difference it's making. Vince, I had yeah. a question that's come up in on the, some of the pages and that. Yeah. Why do we stop having to call in for overnight parking for one night parking? Because we, we got rid of the list. Okay, what, what was the reason for that? Uh, I was tying up dispatch between uh, before it used to be 11 o'clock when you were here, right? Uh, from seven o'clock on nonstop tying up the dispatchers. And it was becoming like it was an, an entitlement. Um, you know, that started out, what, for emergencies, your car was broke down or an out-of-town person. Right. We decided to either get a temporary pass, you pay, the, you know, for the month, or you get a full annual pass. 
Okay. That's basically what it was about. It was just, it was becoming three, four pages of the dispatcher taking phone calls and tying them up. Yeah. I mean, I remember it used to be, back when I was there, it used to be two or three pages long and yeah. Okay. I was just, somebody had asked about it and we never really figured out what the purpose of why it was stopped. Yeah. We, we were watching over the last couple of years, there were a lot of residents that could have got a pass and they, used to, they weren't. So it, it kind of feed the purpose. Kathy, was that a question? No. Was I doing something? Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Hey, Kathy. I was I thought you joined earlier and I was going to say, hey, how's it going? I have a question. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a hard time understanding. This is an old timer question, okay? Um, I have a hard time understanding with the city charter. We have a police department and a fire department that are separate because that's what we have to have. So how is it that you merge the public safety into with having separate departments? Through the, uh, it was through uh, collective bargaining with the fire department. They allowed the police officers that, that were cross-trained to assist them. So we're, we're like a hybrid. And so that's actually another good question, uh, David. That was a good one. Um, the public safety department now that we have, it's been around since about 2012 or 2010 or so. Around there, yeah. Okay. And, you know, so we have six firefighters who are, you know, most of them and are all cross-trained, um, you know, or the, am I getting the... the, the yeah, the firefighters are not cross-trained. Only, okay. only the police officers are. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. So with the fire department, then basically with the fire department, we have two firefighters on duty, and then how many PSOs are the four? Uh, at least two. At least two? At least two. Every shift's got to have at least two PSOs, because we have to meet our mutual aid responsibilities to the gross points where we have to provide at least three fire right. suppression personnel. Okay. So, I, you know, over the years, uh, I don't think the department was totally committed to doing the, the public safety end of it. Right? I think we were hurting for some bodies and a prior administration hired some people that probably weren't going to be able to go to the fire academy just because we were hurting for police officers here um, that they, you know, they were old, too old to go to the fire academy. So that's where we have to get to so we can have five officers that are cross trained. That's what we're working towards. Okay. I just want you to I want you to know, like doing the math in my head, and with you know four guys per shift. I'm not sure if there's an extra for radar or not, but they are so busy all over the place. Right. Um, it's, you it's, know, it's 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 a task to handle, but you know we can do it. Uh, it it's it's doable. Well, I can tell you this: if I have to call, you guys are here in like like not even two minutes if I need you. you right. Know? So. You know, I don't have any complaints with the service. I'm just concerned um, where our future is headed. Um, and I'm really bummed out about this, but with you retiring next year, I, I'm not understanding what the new public system, public safety system is going to be. We're, we're still actively working towards that model. Um, it might be a hybrid for a while, but you know, mm -hmm. that's what we're working towards. Uh, we just recently did a contract for the patrol we, we have to, you know, maintain it. We're going to send at least two personnel each year to the fire academy because obviously it's putting a strain on, on the guys that are just cross-trained um, as opposed to the, the regular police officers that aren't certified. You know, the, the uh, cross-trained guys are going to training every month, fire training on top of, you know, their other duties. And then, you know, in the event of fire does come out, yeah, they're having to, you know, do both jobs that day. But that's where we get into the, the mutual aid with, with the gross points and them helping us out, you know, the farms is good and the woods are, are really good at assisting us um, closer by when we do have a major incident. And I do, I did just want to mention to, you know, most, you know, small municipalities have kind of adopted a public safety sort of uh, formula where, you know, their police officers and firefighters, you know, are together and, you know, just not just a fire department and, you know, we still have those things, but at the same time, you know, there's that cross training element that's involved. I know the gross points, um, most of them do have a, a system like this as well. Um, and um, Alicia McKay joined us and she did have a question. So feel free to ask. 
Um, and I apologize if you kind of already discussed this, but I'm just wondering about um, visibility of officers and patrolling um, within the neighborhoods. Um, you know, I've been here for just about seven years and like comparing the visibility seven years ago to now, um, you know, we rarely see officers um, down our street. Um, definitely um, not as much as we go towards um, Maras as we had when we first moved into the city. So we're just wondering about um, community policing and plans, like what are those numbers looking like? Um, you know, how many officers are just out and not responding necessarily to calls, but just being um, visible? All right, right now we're down a lot of bodies. So this year we can't really go off this year. Um, and when we have our, our five officer shifts, um, plus some more part-timers, we hope to increase the visibility. Um, you know, right now they're going run to run, pretty much. And if you see them sitting in the park, they're probably writing a report. Um, but yeah, they, they do have to do a better job patrolling the neighborhoods. And my, my biggest thing when I, you know, when I started here and did all the time, the first hour or two, that's all I did was go up and down every street, make sure everyone saw a car. So we have to do a better job of that. Do they still have a oh. minimum manpower? Yeah, it's yeah. four officers. It's, oh, sorry? Four yeah. officers. Four? Yeah, four men. And so what's the what's the goal of the department for um, like the officers they would need to retain or to obtain to allow that to happen again, you know, um, so they won't be run to run only? Well, I mean, we've, we've got a lot of personnel that are, um, you know, on administrative leave right now. I don't want to get too much into it, but just events in the city. So until we get that personnel down, you know, we're down. Uh, pretty much six bodies, not, not just police officers, but um, staff inside to monitor uh, anyone that's in custody. So we have to pull the officers off that. Um, so we have somebody in here all the time. We're still, we're still reaching the four man minimum. So you have at least four officers out there. And I, I think you may not see them as much, but I think our response time is still right on. Um, we're still there when everybody calls us. I know it's not not what you want to hear right now, Alicia, but we're working on it. Um, we 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 lost part timers that was unforeseeable in, in, in the last few months too that decided to retire or go other places. So that kind of hurt us a little bit manpower wise. Um, and a lot of the academies were shut down for a little bit, so trying to get recruits out of there. And I know Schoolcraft just had uh, seven cadets test positive for COVID, so they shut down. You know, 2020 is not not a good year all the way around. Oh, thank you. No, I understand. Um, and I do agree with the response time is good. It's just, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I hear you, Lucia. It's not, yeah. you know, you're not the only one that's the voice is concerned, you know, going up there with the traffic complaints, all that. I hear it every day. You know, we're doing what we can. Um, not, It's not an excuse, but, you know, we can do better. So I'm glad we, we have this, this forum here to, to actually hear complaints because, you know, I don't hear them enough, so I, I want to hear them. We, we, want to make right. we want to make everybody feel comfortable in the city, you know, and, and safe. Right, right. Thank so, you. And thank you. Thank you, everybody, for who, you know, for asking the questions. And um, I'm not sure if that is Michael with his hand up from before or if you have a question currently. Uh, you're still muted. Um, no, actually, I don't. I'm sorry. I was just kind of grabbing my chin. <laughs> oh, I wasn't okay. raising my hand or anything. But, uh, uh, but um, yeah, I guess I can ask a quick question. I personally would like to be involved. Uh, what can I do as a uh, resident of Harper Woods to help out? Well, you, you know, start coming to our, our neighborhood meeting once a month. Um, you know, we we want to try and get residents from every street in the city so that you can act as a liaison to, to the people on your street. Uh, we can get that, you know, you got my email, so you can, I can let you know what our next meeting is. It's probably gonna be Zoom right now, but uh, it, yeah. it, it's, 
it's really cool that they had this group. I wish they had it when I lived here. It's good to be, you know, I'm proud to be part of it. Um, as you get everybody's input, everybody gets to know each other. And then you can provide some more information. It's another avenue for me to provide information when, you know, at these monthly meetings. Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. I'll go ahead and do that and I'll, uh, I'll send, you know, send you an email. Cause I live on Eastwood Drive. So right off of Beaconsfield. Yeah, what I, what I like most about this group too is, you know, I've learned it from the neighborhoods I've lived in over the last 10 years that not enough neighbors know each other. Everyone's pretty much uh, isolated in their homes. They don't really talk like they used to. So you don't know who's living next to you. And this group allows you to know, you know who's living where. It, it, it's a good family, you know, community feeling. Yeah, because we also uh, have those meetings with, uh, uh, well, we helped put them together it would be Cheryl Constantino, um, myself, uh, I believe Tim uh, Kalin, Kalin. Um, so you can you can contact any of them at any time, but I believe the next meeting because of Christmas is going to be in January. Um, that was the latest that I heard, but I don't know a date yet. We'll get you added to the emailing list and also reach out to um, Director Smith um, per the email I dropped in the chat here. So scroll up and you can get that. Um, any other questions or comments? Looks like Ron was about to ask something. No, okay. I'll follow up on something if nobody will. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, um, you, you may not know this Director Smith, but uh, when when these uh, speed things were originally uh, from this company, they were supposed to be like mobile trailers and have Wi-Fi and all this other cool stuff. Well, we ended up with the poles, which, you know, surprised some of us. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the pole on Beaconsfield and Huntington has a lot of problems. I don't know why. And then the one on Beaconsfield, when the people are coming north from Moross, you can notice them slow down, but then once they get past, they like, you know, they like to fly. But coming the other way from Eastland, that's where they're bad. So I'm wondering, um, with the technology that these have, do they send you like uh, Wi-Fi reports of like certain areas that are a problem? No, we have to download the data through Bluetooth. We have to download to the computers. So we have to take a laptop out there and download it. Um, the portable ones, we have to charge them. So when we bring them in, that's when they download the information. This is, this is a question, um, you know, actually for both Ron and for um, Director Smith. So what is the relationship like between, you know, Eastland security and, you know, just, just our police officers? And what was that relationship like in the past, you know, when, you know, my understanding is that the Eastland security had a very robust kind of, you know, um, just multiple cars, multiple officers. And, you know, so now what is that like then? And then now what is that coordination like? Um, yeah, I mean, I know for a long time they had police powers. I don't remember when they lost their, their, uh, their police officer status. Um, they didn't carry guns when I started here, but they were still able to arrest people. Um, so that kind of kept, they had a pretty large department. Uh, and then they, they sold off, another owner bought them all and then they decided to start cutting the staff and our, the insurance was too much for that to keep that status. Um, so we still, have, we still have a relationship with them. Um, you know, there's not that many stores there, uh, but the, you know, the mall owner um, doesn't want to provide additional security to what they have right now. And, you know, we, we patrol as much as we can, you know, through there. I think back when I worked, they, they had almost probably as many people working in the mall that we had in the city. Uh, we used to have a, a really good relationship with them. Uh, we did work over there with them, between them, with Hudson Security, Penny Security, all the security groups. We, we, we were there so much that we had a really good relationship back then. But I know it, it's changed a lot now with just with no manpower there. And I don't, not, not even sure what they have there now. But back then they had a pretty robust department and with cars and equipment and everything else. I mean, obviously it shows that, you know, the money coming in there, they're not taking care of the property. So, um, you know, hopefully we have some kind of sale of, of that property, you know, in the future and it'll help out the city. 
Right, right. And, and hopefully we do have some we have some good things on the horizon. And, you know, hopefully this is going to be something that, you know, goes through and that it's it's something that's positive for our community. Um, because, you know, based on what you're saying, you know, there wasn't a lot of crime at Eastland versus in the past, there were things like carjackings and, you know, robberies and or speeding or issues and, you know, theft. But now, you know, you're not really seeing things except with this weird year that we call 2020, where you have this this uptick in you know, things that have happened and um, how many incidences have, have actually happened this year at uh, Eastland Mall, like in between, like, just like shootings or things? As far as the shootings go, there was two different shootings um, in October, but it's hard this year because they were shut down from March till like late June. Um, and I think their hours were only till six when they did open, they closed like six. So uh, there weren't that many stores in there. So we weren't having to respond as much. But I think I can't really give you an exact number because most of those were us checking the mall property during the shutdown. A lot of our incidents over there. I think over the years, that was always a problem in Harper Woods because East Lane crime was always counted in, as Harper Woods crime. So every retail fraud, every car theft, everything that happened there went on to the Harper Woods yeah. numbers. So it made inflated the city's numbers tremendously because there wasn't much crime in the city if you took out the East Lane crime. So I think that for years, that's what Harpwood's really suffered for that by having all those numbers added to our the city numbers. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and so we had Rebecca join us and then we've had Greg and Mike and you know Steve, a couple other folks who are on here who are kind of quiet. We wanna hear from all of you if you do have questions. Um, but I do also want to, since we do have uh, Corinne Martin on the call, um, what is the relationship like between like the Gross Point Animal Adoption Society and, you know, Kaiser, the um, canine patrol officer and the police force? What is that? Because I know that you guys have a lot of uh, the canine animal fundraisers and, you know, and then Chief Smith, if you want to take that one as well. It's, it's definitely a cooperative uh, team here. Uh, with, without Corinne and that, we, we might not have Kaiser. So obviously she's our, our biggest supporter and we try to support her as much as possible. Um, you know, if you can't support G pass, cause without them, I mean, they're, I will say that since I've been at the, the, the amount of strays we pick up on vicious dogs that come into our city, you know, it's too much for us to keep up with. <laughs> That's why I think we need to educate as far as that goes to that last workshop. We try to educate newer residents uh, about the ordinances for dogs and, keeping them on their leash and getting their vaccination and, and uh, licensed. Oh, uh, if Corinne's there, she's listening. I am. Oh, there she is. I can talk. I just, uh, I, um, yeah, I'm just not going to do the photo right now, if that's okay. That's fine. No, that's the theme for tonight. Nobody's got cameras on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want to see me after seven o'clock. Anyways, um, yeah, no, I um, I completely support the police department and uh, Gross Point Animal Adoption Society was able to um, form a Friends of the Harper Woods Canine Program, which allows us to raise and collect funds for the Harper Woods Canine Program and turn them over to the police department to be utilized for that program specifically. So we plan to continue that. Um, we love that work um, and it, it benefits the community and um, all of our supporters. So we'd like to continue to do that as long as we can. Thank you for that. Um, I do have a question, like how often do we need to use Kaiser and like, well, what functions does he serve? Is it is it mostly for like drugs and narcotics and, you know, just other crime related issues where you need kind of like that kind of a detective where the dog. Yeah, he's, kind of yeah, he's mostly uh, narcotics and, and searches. That's what he's guys are for. And it's not that often he's got he's called out, but. They, they, the canines in the area have a partnership, so if one's unavailable, we can call if we need somebody to do a search for, for someone we're looking for. Um, and that's where it comes in handy. We never had one before. It seemed like we always needed one, and Detroit was always busy, or we'd have to call the state police, and they never had one. You know, it, when we need them, it, it's definitely useful. But he goes to training. Uh, he's he's got to do 16 hours every month as part of the uh, requirements. So he's out there every Wednesday at his uh, training facility. 
And he's the star of the show. I mean, he's got trading cards. I don't have trading cards. Right, right. I noticed that. Like, I, I even have a little sticker of him on my on my car. So, um, okay. Anybody else with uh, more questions? Welcome, Rebecca and uh, Patrick Hughes, Adrian. I just want to make this clear, though. This this, this uh, workshop is about. It says public safety, but it's about the law enforcement function. It has nothing to do with the fire side of it. I don't want this to be confused that this is some kind of uh, trying to get this across for a vote or anything like that for public safety. This is about the law enforcement function, the issues affecting law enforcement right now. I just wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to thank you guys for all that you do. And I know it's a tough job. And each time I've made a call or, or called you guys, you guys come right out. You know, the officers have been very professional. I have not run into anybody with a bad attitude or wasn't interested in what the issue was. So I just want to say thank you guys and, um, you know, continue to keep you guys in our prayers and thank you. Just keep us updated on what you need us to do as a community. Because I know it's hard. So, but thank you. No, th thank you for those words. Appreciate no it. No problem. Right. Well, um, if there are no other questions, um, you know, I just wanted to be able to make sure that, you know, folks, you know, did have that conversation with our law enforcement to really have that sense of, you know, we are a community together. And, you know, um, I believe it was a, it's a Sir Robert Peel quote that you use, uh, Chief, where it's just like of the community for the community. And, you know, I know I'm working to make sure that, you know, our, our law enforcement here serves us as a community and that, you know, we're all in the same loop and that, that we're taking care of each other. So, uh, you know, to be able to have these kind of candid conversations on issues ranging from speeding to, you know, um, you know, just shootings and, and things that we're concerned about, things that we want to know, like what are active solutions, what are active, you know, procedures and protocols that are being worked on, not only on, you know, the law, the part of law enforcement, but also council. So, you know, um, and then what can citizens do to kind of help um, as the question was posed and um, also having, you know, Ron and um, hopefully next time we have this kind of conversation, um, we can we can also have Darlene join us. I know she was supposed to be here. Um, and, you know, so I really want to, you know, just getting back to the whole purpose of this, which is to, in an ideal world, what would we want from our public safety officers? What do we want to see more of, less of? What do we want to thank them for doing a great job on? What do we want to say, hey, you guys need to step it up on this, you know, and, you know, with COVID being, you know, the 2020s big giant issue and the elephant in the room, um, you know, there, there are some challenges that have been posed and there's also been a lot of, you know, upheaval due to social justice and, you know, um, racial reckoning that, you know, also have to be addressed when it comes to, you know, community policing and policing in general throughout the country. So um, thank you so much for, for joining. It looked like David had a question before we close things out. Mm -hmm. um, well, I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to give a little bit of background. Uh, Director Smith, we have great communications. Uh, we talk a lot by email. Um, one of your officers were called by a neighbor because I was not seen out of my house for a week. And that officer actually came by and made sure that like I wasn't being like crazy in some way, shape or form. And he wouldn't leave until he knew I was okay. And, uh, you know, I, I think that our officers are 100% are cool and I back them 100%. We just need more of them is the problem. Right. Um, and, and with Mr. Tofrey, um, you know, Ron, back in the day, you know what, you watched Kelly Road, I think, when I was a kid. So he's kind of more like dad, but I won't call him that. So I don't know if you know, Vince, I, Dave's mother used to work at an apartment years ago. Yes. I think maybe before you came on, she was dispatcher yep. back then when I started. Yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you guys and thanks Ernestine for this workshop because I, I, I really enjoyed the communications with the uh, both officers. Well, one retired, one going to be. Also, Cynthia had a really good question and I, I want to challenge myself to make sure I learn everybody's name. I know most of our firefighters by name, but um, with police officers, sometimes I'll like, so she asks, uh, what are the names of our officers? 
So I guess uh, she, <laughs> she's calling you out to ask, ask, answer and uh, you know, tell us the names of every single last officer we have. All right, let me, uh, all right, let's go. Uh, right now you got Lieutenant Jason Hammerly. Uh, you have Officer Elijah Lowry, Officer Dan McCaw, and we're, we're short two officers because one has COVID right now. So uh, that's Chris Joseph. Uh, our dispatcher uh, right now would be Sandra Oliveri, but she's out on injury right now. Uh, we have Patrick Hughes, a dispatcher. Rosemary Schroeder is a dispatcher. Carrie Wilson's a dispatcher. Uh, we have uh, Deputy Chief Ted Stager, Detective Sergeant uh, Jim Ruthenberg. Detective Mac Lacerdo, Detective Glenn He. I can email you. Email, uh, you know your email address off the line. All right, Cynthia. It's like, it's like a test right now. I'm trying to remember who I'm missing, but we have oh, Tony Abdullah. Our, uh, yeah. Tony Abdullah, yeah. That's the name I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But let me let me give you my email again. Uh it's V like Vince Smith, S-M-I-T-H at Harperwoods.net. And like I said. Feel free to email me. I, I answer you as soon as I can the next day, okay? Whatever. If you send it to me tonight, I'll get to you tomorrow. So before we close, though, I want to make sure. So the southwest corner, more patrol, uh, Alicia patrol visibility, the traffic stats we want out, uh, and more information on, on Nixle. That's and so you, you you also mentioned a possibility of having a official you know uh, social media presence. Yeah, um, we gotta look at that still, but yeah, that mm -hmm. could be in the works. I've been getting pushback on that from the cities because I think the city should have like an official Facebook page that is manned by you know the city, so that way you know the narrative of what we get. I mean, I love our community groups because we got some of the admins here, you know. But um, you know, just kind of having that 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 nice message that is cohesive, you know, coming from the officials. So, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, city council meetings are, are the way to go too. All right. If you, if you want to voice some concerns or, or changes, you know, that's your way to do it. That's your elected body, you know, to go there during our uh, monthly meetings. So I, I know a lot of, a lot of residents don't participate, but I really, I strongly encourage you to participate and, and voice some of your concerns out there. So council does here. For sure. And you just know that like we're we're also available, or at least I'm, I'm just going to speak for myself. I'm available. Uh, text me, call me. Most of you have somehow, somehow, some way to contact me. And, you know, we can just make sure that things are, you know, just just being addressed and, you know, brought to the attention of the legislative body and or the city manager, who's really the person who runs the show when you really think about it in a, a small municipality like this one. So, um, yeah, thank at, you. So much. The, um City Council, have they gotten to the um, city sponsored emails yet? I know that was a talk at one of the meetings. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there was a gentleman who came to a couple of meetings and he was very upset that we didn't have, and I thought this was odd, you know, that the city, we never actually had official emails. And it was my understanding that we only recently transitioned in the past maybe 10 years to having emails, um, whereas everything used to be hand delivered. Um, the, the council packets would be hand delivered, um, like circa probably like 2005, you know, um, and so now officially every council member does have a council email and matter of fact, I'm going to put mine in the chat as well, uh, my council email. So everyone does have that official, you know, city council address. So it's um, elions at harperwoods.net. Let me pull that up and pop that in the chat. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for everybody for for coming here and for you know asking the questions that you ask and being insightful and being community minded and civic minded because like I said, um, you know, the, the the idea came before council to have a public safety commission. And I know I'm committed to making sure that we have something like that that you know kind of has a degree of citizen oversight um and you know thank you so much vince smith um and ron tolfrey for for coming here and thank you all for attending thank you everybody thank you all right everybody have a good night be safe and you know just look forward to more of these kind of things from us, from us. so 
All right. Have a good one. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Kathy. Bye-bye. Bye, Kathy. Good night. Good night, good night everybody. Good night from the Sturtons. <laughs>